Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When you think of wine, geographically, what comes to mind? Maybe you think of California. Got all the vineyards out in California. Maybe you think of France, which is very famous for all of its, uh, its vinting. Of course, maybe your worldview is a little bit more limited and you think of the little Cottonwood Valley and you think of our own winery here in our area. But probably we don't think real quickly about Israel. And yet down through the ages, Israel has been a place where wine has been vented for, for centuries, centuries, going way back before the days of Moses. The climate in much of Israel is just white for, right for wine growing. There's one historian who has surmised that at times there may have been more wine in the land of Israel than there was water, especially if there were times of drought. Now, I don't know if that's factual or not, but one historian surmised that. But the fact is, down through the ages, wine has been grown or has been vented, grapes have been grown, and wine has been a staple for the people of Israel, in part because their water hasn't always been so good. And just as when it comes to our, uh, our water treatment places, a lot of times they'll use chemicals like chlorine and so on to make the more water more suitable for drinking. In the Middle East and in Israel, they mixed the wine with the water to kill the bugs. And so Jesus, as he so often did, taking things from everyday life, took the picture of the vineyard and winemaking. And in the gospel reading that we have for this evening, the thing that our Lord wants us to take home is the fact that we branches need him, the vine. Now, Jesus taught this lesson the night before he was crucified. He was in the upper room somewhere in the city of Jerusalem. He was meeting with his disciples for that last Passover. And, and he was giving them his farewell address after supper, after he had instituted the Lord's Supper. And uh, he had told them that uh, as he had loved them, he wanted them to love one another. He said, you know, by your loving one another, people will know that you are my disciples. In other words, he is telling them, let your light shine. Let the love flow from you so people can see that just as I am love, my love dwells in you. And so there were really two things that Jesus wanted to emphasize to his disciples in this, this farewell address. One was that they remain in him, that they continue in the, the Christian faith, because apart from Christ, there is no life. And the other was that they love one another so that they could witness to the world that they were Christians and that the Christian life was also characterized by Christian love. So Jesus picks up on this picture of the, the vine and the branches. And of course, he says that he is the vine. And it gives us that picture of a, a, a vine in a, a vineyard. And just as the vine, through its roots, takes in nourishment and moisture and, and sucks it up, so to speak, and processes it and passes it along to the branch so that the branch can remain alive and can produce much fruit. So Jesus, being the very Son of God, passes along the life and the love that are part of his very essence to those who believe in him so that we can be alive and that we can produce much fruit. Now he talks about the gardener. And the gardener is God the Father. And he talks about God the Father cutting off those branches that are dead and don't bear fruit. And, and I suppose we could say that those are branches that maybe uh, were people who claimed to be Christian, but somewhere along the line their faith died out. And so the gardener is going to prune them off because they're not really part of the, the, the whole plant itself, the church of God. Well, on the other hand, when it comes to those who are connected through faith and are God's people, the Lord does things to help us grow in our faith and to become more healthy and more productive. And, of course, he talks about the branches. And the fact is that we, who are God's people, are those branches who are connected. 
the Holy Spirit, by the grace, the undeserved love of God, used the gospel, whether it was in baptism or the gospel message that we heard, and brought us to faith and connected us to, us to Jesus and made us all part of, of that, that holy Christian church and the family of God. And of course, Jesus then talks about those branches that are not alive. And I've already mentioned, those are, those are the branches that maybe were people who early in their life had come to saving faith through Jesus Christ and, and then because of something that happened, maybe they became distracted by their work or maybe by material possessions or, or certain pleasures. Or sometimes it was that somebody in the church, whether it was a called worker, or maybe it was a member who said something that perhaps they didn't even think was all that hurtful, but it was very offensive to the person who heard it and who was hurt by it. Or, or maybe it was a case of where this person just became lax when, uh, in reference to hearing the word of God and receiving the sacrament of Holy Communion or got caught up in some sinful lifestyle and didn't turn from it. Because, you know, sin has a way of, of taking control if we do not control it and if we do not deal with it through repentance. And it has a way of dominating people and, and making them slaves to that sin and eventually can choke off saving faith where the sin becomes more important than the Savior. And finally, what happens then is the saving faith dies out. On the other hand, it could be somebody who is what, what we would call a true blue hypocrite. Now, I realize we're all hypocrites to one extent or another. We say we're Christians. We say we love the Lord. We say that we're going to live for the Lord. And yet, sometimes our, our love limps and it lacks, doesn't it? We, we don't always talk the way we should. We don't always show the love that uh, the Lord wants us to show. And, and yet we're Christian people who do what we do out of weakness and ignorance and we stand in grace and, and we're still clothed in the righteousness of Jesus and, and we enjoy the forgiveness of sins. But there are those other, those other hypocrites that they give the impression that they're Christian when they're not. Maybe, maybe they're part of a church because it keeps peace in the family or perhaps it's, it's good for business or or maybe it gains influence in some other way. And the Lord compares them to branches that are dead. And you notice he talked about what the gardener would do when it came to those branches. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it'll be more fruitful. Or we go to verse 6, If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burnt. And so here really Jesus is, is giving a warning of his law, first of all to those who are unbelievers, of the impending condemnation that awaits them if they are not connected to the vine. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But he went on to say that those who have not believed are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And so Jesus is issuing a warning to unbelievers, but he's also issuing a warning to us who are branches who are connected to the vine, people who are part of the family of God. He's saying, don't become lax, don't become lazy when it comes to your Christian faith and you're, you're growing in your faith. You're, you're hearing the word of God, you're receiving the sacrament, you're applying it to your daily life. Uh, you're living that faith in your, your prayer life and the love that you show to other people. Don't let sin dominate you in your life. When you see sin, cut it off right away. Repent of it, turn away, turn to your Savior and pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to help you to live that godly life. And use the Word of God and receive the sacrament to grow in your faith so that you, you, can, you can continue to be connected to the vine and of course, he says that those who are connected to the vine are going to produce much fruit. And those fruit of which Jesus talks are the good works and the Christian characteristics that the Spirit produces within us. 
Maybe you remember the words of the Apostle Paul as he wrote to the Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness. There's a kindness in there, gentleness, and self-control. Or as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he talked about the fruit of the light being, being goodness and righteousness and truth. And these are things that the Lord wants to, to flow from us uh, in terms of the characteristics that we show, the attitude, the personality that we have. But then as he told his disciples, as I have loved you, I want you to love one another. Whether we always like everything about everybody that's part of our church family or, or the people with whom we come in contact, the Lord wants us to have that love, that concern for their soul and their spiritual welfare and for their overall well-being. One of the things that the Lord tells us about being connected to him is that we are already clean. He says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. When we come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, yesterday, for example, baptized a little baby. His name was uh, Javen Daniel Orlowski. And uh, he had a little white suit on, you know, like sometimes babies do. Sometimes babies are wearing little dresses, and sometimes boy babies are wearing little dresses. And I don't think it really hurts them every once in a while to wear dress. I know my sister used to dress me up in a dress once in a while. There's some very incriminating pictures of me when I was a little boy. Um, but I survived and I made it and I don't have an identity crisis or anything. And those little babies who are in those little gowns. But that whiteness of those gowns and those suits is so symbolic. You know, Paul wrote to the Galatians, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And it's not because we put on the holiness and the righteousness of Christ, but it's because the Holy Spirit has dressed us in that righteousness of Christ. And every day as we live our lives through faith in Jesus, we wear that holiness. And as God looks at us, he, he doesn't see the, the sinfulness that we know stains our lives. And there are those days we look at ourselves and we think, oh my goodness, and I call myself a Christian. But God looks at us in Christ, dressed in that holiness of Jesus, and he sees us as clean because we've been cleansed in the blood of Jesus. We wear the holiness of Jesus through that word of the gospel that, that, that our Lord has spoken to us. And I realize that none of us has had the Lord Jesus come to us and preach and teach us personally, but, but through the people in our lives who have shared the word of God with us and have administered the sacraments, your pastors, your teachers, your parents, other people who are influence, influences in your life. And as a result of this, you are clean. And sometimes God in his love, as Jesus talks about in this section, also prunes. He prunes every branch that does bear fruit so that it will be even more fruitful. And, and of course that pruning comes through, for example, the use of God's law. What we're doing right here, when I talked a little while ago about the fact that, you know, sometimes we're hypocritical and we don't, we don't always say the things that we ought to. We don't always do the things that we ought to. We commit the sins of weakness and ignorance. That's God's law by which he comes along and he snips at us. When we start to think that, that we're the ones who are the cause of our salvation and we're reminded that we can't do anything to save ourselves, it's all God and not us. It's that, that pruning that God's doing to, to, to prune out the self-righteousness of our sinful nature. But then he comes along with the gospel and he feeds uh, the, the branches. He feeds us as he gives us that gospel message that he loves us and we're precious in his sight and he's with us each and every day and he has eternal life waiting for us. And even when there are hard things and bad things that happen in our lives, he's going to be with us to help us through those things. And God uses those hard things at times, doesn't he, to do some pruning. You think of how things get kind of jumbled up when it comes to priorities. And we're busy doing this, and we're active doing that, and maybe we're not so busy and so active when it comes to our relationship with God or our relationship with those who are close to us in life. And all of a sudden, God lets something happen 
that uh, maybe puts us flat on our back or down on our knees. And suddenly we begin to examine what, what's really most important in my life. When our life is on the line, for example, and we're facing death, do all those other things that we thought were so important really matter? You know, we can't take them to heaven. We can't do, do them in heaven. They won't get us into heaven. But what is it that will it's only through faith in Jesus. It's only through our Savior, the way, the truth, the life, that we get it into heaven. And suddenly, we get religion again, right? God draws us closer to himself, and he moves us to, to be more spiritual. And you think of how we go through those times, and, and maybe, maybe the time that we spend in prayer doubles, triples, quadruples, because we realize, I, I can't do this myself. I'm so insufficient and we remember how there is no problem that's bigger than God. God's bigger than any problem that we have. And so we turn to our Lord. And he uses those things to, to turn us away from those weaknesses and those sins in our lives, those goofed up priorities. And, and he brings us back to himself and to Jesus, the, the risen and living Lord and Savior, in whom we have life and in whom we have light. And you see, God keeps doing this because he wants us to produce those good fruit. He wants us to be like those healthy vines that have those branches that, that are just loaded with grapes. Grapes for eating and grapes for, for, for using and beverages that were so important in, in the lives of those who lived in Israel. God wants us to produce those good works. Do you remember those words of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is a gift of God so that no one should boast. Then Paul goes on, he says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which God planned before the creation of the world. God did what he did in saving us through the, the Savior Jesus and bringing us to faith so that we would enjoy his life here and now, but hereafter in heaven. But he also did that so here and now we would serve him by using the gifts that he has given us to, to do the things that we can do when it comes to carrying out that great commission, by being the best husband or the best wife, the best mother, the best father, the best son, the best daughter, the best brother, the best sister, the best worker, the best citizen, the best whatever it is that we are to the glory of God. And those are the fruit that God wants us to produce. You know, it seems like it's taken forever for spring to get here. I know I've heard some people complain today how, yep, it happened. We just jumped from winter to summer, 80, 80 some degrees today. But we haven't seen the trees blossom yet, right? Pretty soon we're going to see the apple trees, maybe the pear trees, the cherry trees. And when we see those branches that are all loaded with, with blossoms, and I just love it to see the, 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 um, the apple trees with the pinks and the whites and the reds and the deep reds. And, and it's just like... You're reminded how, of how God is such an artist when it comes to his creation. And it reminds us that that is a tree that's alive. That is a tree that's going to produce much fruit, all those blossoms. And God is telling us, I've connected you to the vine. I've made you branches that are alive in Christ so that you, like those trees, can blossom and produce much fruit. So stay connected. Blossom with the power and the love, the life that God gives you, and produce that fruit to the glory of God for the good of those around you and also for the blessing of yourself. And the peace of God that passes understanding will keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.